example 4.4.1. This example says, you are offered the following investment. In exchange for a single payment today, you will receive three payments of $10,000 at the end of the next three years. If you can earn 8% invest, if you can earn 8% on investments of similar risk, how much are you willing to pay for this investment? All right, we've got a time value of money problem, so we're going to follow our three-step process where we begin in step one by mapping out the cash flows so that we can identify what type of cash flow we've got and apply the appropriate time value money tools to evaluate it. Uh, we'll draw our timeline. At time period zero, we're looking for how much we would be willing to pay for this investment today, so we don't know what cash flow happens at time period zero. We do know that if we pay some amount today, we expect to receive $10,000 at the end of each of the next three years. So that means one year from now, we'll receive $10,000, or at least we expect to receive $10,000. Two years from now, we'll receive another $10,000. And then finally, three years from today, we will receive one more payment of $10,000. All right, now there's one more piece of information we have not captured yet. It says, if you can earn 8% on investments of similar risk, how much are you willing to pay for this investment? All right, so the way we would use that 8% is that is our opportunity cost. That is what we could earn with our money somewhere else while taking on similar risk. So at a minimum, we want to earn 8% on this particular investment. So if we were to discount each of these three cash flows, back to time period zero dollars, find the present value of each one of them using an 8% discount rate to find the present value, then we will find the maximum we would be willing to pay for this investment. Right? Whatever the present value of these three cash flows is, discounted at 8%, if we were to pay that amount today, we would earn exactly 8% on this particular investment and so that's the maximum we'd be willing to pay because we can earn 8% elsewhere. If we paid any more, we would be earning less than 8%. If we could manage to pay less for the investment, then we'd actually be earning more than 8% and it would be even more attractive. So in order to figure out what we want to pay today, we want to discount each one of these cash flows back to time period $0 at an 8% interest rate and figure out what the present value is of those cash flows. All right, we've got all our information mapped out. We know we've got three cash flows happening at the end of each period. We've got a discount rate of 8%. And so step two is to figure out what type of cash flow we're dealing with here so that we can then apply the appropriate tool to find the present value. If we skip over to our cheat sheet, we've got three types of cash flows. We've got a lump sum. We've got lump sums, we've got perpetuities. Perpetuities we can discount because perpetuity goes on forever. This particular cash flow that we're looking at just has three payments and then it stops. So we know we're not looking at a perpetuity. It's either going to be in a lump it's either going to be a lump sum or some form of annuity. Uh, lump sums we have dealt with in the previous examples and and in fact the lump sum formulas would work just fine for this one, but we can take a shortcut in this case if we recognize that it is an annuity where an annuity, we have, we have three flavors. The first one is an ordinary annuity. This is a finite series of equal cash flows at regular intervals paid at the end of each period. And our example timeline, in fact, looks exactly like the one that we're looking at in this particular example, where we have three $10,000 cash flows that we want to find the present value of, and even the discount rate is the same. Probably because this cheat sheet stole this, um, or borrowed the particular timeline from this actual example. All right, so we've got an ordinary annuity. Now, just very quickly before we go too much further, uh, the other two types of annuities are an annuity due, which we have next on the list. An annuity due is the same level cash flows at regular intervals. The only difference between an ordinary annuity and annuity due is that an annuity due has cash flows at the beginning of the period. So if we were to map out the cash flows and see a cash flow at the very beginning of our timeline starting today, then we would know that we're dealing with an annuity due because the cash flows are bumped up to the beginning of the period. That's not what we have here. The problem actually says the cash flows happen at 
the end of the next three years. It says you will receive three payments of $10,000 at the end of the next three years. Okay, so we know it's not an annuity due. The third type of annuity is a growing annuity. And this is where we've got cash flows at regular intervals, but they're growing at some set rate. So the cash flows are actually decreasing at a set rate, or they could be, or their cash flows are increasing at a set rate, or they could even be decreasing at a set rate. And again, that's not what we have here. So we know that we are dealing with an ordinary annuity. All right? And then once we have identified that we're dealing with an ordinary annuity, ordinary annuity, then we know what options are available to us to be able to evaluate this thing. We, in general, there are three options. We could use either the present value or future value of an ordinary annuity formula, just depending on what we're looking for. In this case, we're looking for the present value, so we'll use the present value formula. We could use the time value money keys on a financial calculator. In this case, we could use either the cash flow worksheet or the time value money keys, the M, I over Y, PV, and so on, and we'll look at both of those. Or we could use a spreadsheet. And again, we'll skip the spreadsheet for these videos just because that's typically not an option that's available to students on exams. So we'll focus on the first two. And let's take them one at a time. We'll start with the formula. All right, and one of the great things about being able to identify the type of cash flow we're looking at here, we know we're looking at an ordinary annuity. So if we were to look at our formula sheet, we've got quite a few formulas in the class. Even in the condensed version, you've got a little over two pages worth of formulas. But once we know we're dealing with an ordinary annuity, we can skip right to those formulas. And we actually only have two. We've got the present value of an ordinary annuity in equation 4.05, or we've got the future value of an ordinary annuity in 4.06. So not only have we nailed down that we can use the formula, but we've also narrowed it down to only two formulas from which to choose. So it really simplifies our life if we can identify what type of cash flow we're looking at. In this case, for this problem, we're looking for the present value of an ordinary annuity. So we're going to use equation 4.05 here, where the present value of an ordinary annuity is equal to and make sure we use the same variable names here, is equal to the payment. In fact, let's make sure and recognize the timing. So we're looking for the present value as of time period zero. So we're then going to use the payment that happens one period later at the end of year one. So we use a subscript one there, divided by the interest rate. And that is going to be times the quantity 1 minus 1 over 1 plus the interest rate raised to the n. All right, so again, we're just using this present value of an ordinary annuity formula here, which is also on the cheat sheet. And those formulas that apply to those cash flows are, are right beneath the example timelines. Okay, so let's plug in the cash flows associated with this actual example, so the present value at time period zero, is equal to the payment one year from today. Well, that is a $10,000 cash inflow Ten thousand divided by our discount rate. In this case, that's 8%, expressed as a decimal as 0 0.08. And anytime we're doing arithmetic, arithmetic with the discount rate or a percentage, we want to convert it to a decimal. We're going to multiply that times the quantity, 1 minus 1 over 1 plus r. Again, 0 0.08 is our interest rate expressed as a decimal, so 1 plus 0 0.08 is 1.08. N is the number of compounding periods, or when we're talking about an annuity, it's the number of actual payments in the annuity. In this case, that's three. We have three payments of 10,000. All right, and I like to work these bit by bit. Instead of, if you have your calculator set up, your BA2 Plus set up to follow the algebraic rules of operations, or even if you're using a scientific calculator, you can enter all this in exactly like it's written and it'll work out just fine. 
the trouble I tend to run into, and I've seen students run into a lot, is that I tend to get towards the end of entering the string of arithmetic, and I'll type something in wrong. And when I do that, it forces me to start completely over. So what I like to do is break these into chunks and solve them one by one and just store values as I go. And that makes it to where I don't have to enter the whole thing in again if I run into a problem and mess something up. But it also means that if I don't get the right answer at the end, it's a lot easier to go back and figure out where I went wrong. I don't have to enter the whole thing in three, four times to see if I come up with the right answer. I can verify it bit by bit and make sure that I haven't made a mistake at each section. So although it seems like it may take a little bit longer to enter it step by step like I'm about to, in the end I find it works out faster. It tends to be faster for me to do it this way because I can track down the errors faster. All right, so I'm just going to work left to right. I'm going to start with 10,000 divided by 0 0.08 equals 125,000 times the quantity 1 minus... 1 over 1.08 cubed. Now I am going to enter this all at once. I'm going to say 1 divided by 1.08 y to the x 3 to raise it to the 3 and equals I'm getting 0.7938 and importantly although the calculator is showing me four decimal places, it is worked out to 13 decimal places and I don't want to give up that precision if I can help it. So what I'm going to do is store that value. I'm going to say STO2 to store it on a 2 key and I'll write myself a little note in case I have to go back and solve it again. And now that I've broken it down into these steps, I can, I'm comfortable entering these one by one just left to right, 125,000 times, open parentheses, 1 minus, recall 2, close parentheses. Okay, now it went ahead and did that subtraction for me, and again, it's only showing me four decimal places, but it used that full 13 decimal version, so I retained all of that precision in this number by not typing in the four decimal approximation. Once all that's in, I can press equals. I'm getting a present value of $25,770 and roughly 97 cents, rounded to the nearest penny. All right, so we've got a number, which is great, but what does this number actually mean? This number means that if we were to pay today... $25,770.97 in order to buy this investment, to buy these future cash flows. So we have a cash outflow of $25,771 roughly. And then over the next three years, we receive three payments of $10,000 at the end of each of those three years. By the time we received that last $10,000 payment at the end of year three, we would have experienced an 8% rate of return on our investment. So that 25000 goes up here as a cash outflow at time period zero. We'll just round it to the nearest dollar. We'll say one so that it fits neatly on our timeline. Okay, that's the formula solution. Let's look at the calculator solution. And with this one, since it's annuity, it's not really, we've got two tools on the financial calculator, right? We've got the time value money keys and we have the cash flow worksheet, both of which will work for lump sums or annuities. In this case, since we've got a straight annuity, the time, just the straight time value money keys are going to be faster. So we'll focus on that one um, and we'll do the cash flow worksheet real quick after that. But let's start with the time value money keys. This is probably the option I would be quick to reach for with this kind of problem. All right, so with the time value money keys, I like to write out the keys in my notes vertically, and I write them out in the same order that they appear on the calculator from left to right, N, I over Y, P, V, P, M, T, and F, V. I just got in the habit of writing them vertically. There's no magic to that. It's just the way that I started doing it in undergrad, and I still do it that way. You're welcome to develop any system you want to keep track of the time value money keys. I just encourage you to come up with a way to do it and do it the same way every single time. 
because that'll maximize your chances of making sure you get the information all in there, you don't miss anything, and you are more likely to get it in the right spot. Okay, for an annuity, N is the number of compounding periods or the number of payments. In this case, that's three. We've got three payments of 10,000. I over Y is our discount rate. That's 8%, and it's looking for a percentage. We can put it in as an 8 and not 0 .08. PV is what we're looking for, or present value is what we're looking for, so put a question mark there. Payment, we're finally going to put something on the payment key. That is the 10000 Okay, and I'm going to adopt the perspective of my pocket. If I were to buy this security today, I'd have a cash outflow of something today, and then I'd receive three cash inflows of 10000 Now, when I put the 10000 on the payment key, that payment key is tied to the N key. So when I put 10000 on the payment key, I'm telling the calculator that I'm going to receive three $10,000 payments at the end of the next three periods. All right, future value is where I would put any additional cash flow at the end of the timeline. If we look at our timeline, we just have the three $10,000 payments at the end of each period. I've already told the calculator that I'm going to receive these when I put it on the payment key, I put the 10,000 on the payment key, and then set N equal to three. There's no additional cash flow that happens at the end of the timeline. And so my future value key, I'm actually going to record a zero. Now, importantly, that doesn't mean that the future value of this annuity is zero. It's not. It's something higher than $30,000 because we've got three payments of $10,000 that would earn interest. What we're doing, though, is we're solving for present value. So the calculator is going to apply the time value money to these payments to find present value. Since we're solving for the present value, what it needs to know on the future value key is is there any additional cash flow at the end of the timeline in addition to the payment that you've already put in? And there's not in this case, so we're going to record a zero there because there's no additional cash flow. Okay, let's type these guys in. I'm going to start by clearing time value money, hitting second clear TVM, and then I'm going to work left to right. N is three, so I'm going to type three, and then N to store it. I over Y is eight, so I'm going to type eight, and then I over Y to store it. Present value is what I'm looking for, so I'm going to skip over it. Payment is 10000 so I'm going to type in 10000 and then press the payment key to store it. And then future value is zero, which it zeroed it out when we cleared it, but just to be sure, I like to go ahead and enter that zero, so nothing's hiding on that key and, and surprising me. And now we've got four of the five variables in, so we can solve for the fifth by hitting compute PV, compute present value, and we're going to get a negative in this case. 25,000, but notice it's the same number, $25,770.97, which is exactly what we got with a formula. Now, this negative doesn't mean that the value is negative. The plus and minus on the cash flow keys and the, and the time value keys are just keeping track of the relative direction of the cash flows. Since I entered the payments as a positive as cash inflows to me, what the calculator is telling me is if I want to earn an 8% rate of return, then I need to be prepared to experience a cash outflow at time period zero of $25,771, roughly. So that's what the negative means. It just means a cash outflow in this case. All right, so that is a second way to solve it. So we know how to do it with the formula. We know how to do it with the time value money keys. Let's also do it with the cash flow worksheet. which we get into by pressing the CF button. All right, when we press the CF button, it pulls up the cash flow worksheet, and this thing is a memory function, just like the time value money keys. So the first thing we want to do is clear that thing out by hitting second and clear work on the bottom left. Second and clear work. And that zeroes out all the entries in the cash flow worksheet. All right, CF zero. Now we can enter the cash flows just like they appear on the timeline. And CF0 is what cash flow happens at time period zero. That's actually what we want to solve for. So I'm going to leave it as the default zero. And when we calculate the present value, it's going to replace that, or it's going to solve for it rather. So CF0 is zero. We can skip right over that. We'll hit the down arrow key to go to the next entry. When I hit the down arrow key, it comes up with CO1. That stands for cash flow one, or what happens at the end, or what happens at the end of year one, the first tick mark on our timeline. On this particular example, that is a cash inflow of $10,000. So CO1 is going to be $10,000. A 
positive 10,000, so I'll type in 10,000. And I need to press Enter to store it. And press Enter to store it on CO1. And then we can hit the down arrow key to go to the next entry. When we hit the down arrow key, it comes up with FO1. FO1 stands for frequency of cash flow one, which means how many times in a row do you experience that $10,000 cash flow you just entered on CO1? Well, in this case, we've got an annuity, and I'm going to receive that $10,000 cash inflow three times in a row. So instead of entering $10,000 three times in a row for CO1, CO2, and CO3, I can just set F01 to 3, and that tells the calculator that I'm going to receive this $10,000 cash inflow three times in a row, and I am done. I don't have to enter any more cash flows because it's already in there. All right, actually, we don't need, I'm not going to write the down arrow key there because now we're done entering the cash flows. What I like to do just to be sure that there's nothing else hiding in the cash flow worksheet on me is hit the down arrow key a few times and make sure there are no other entries showing up. When I hit the down arrow key once, I get CO2 and it's set to zero. Notice there's no equal sign or sideways triangle, so it's telling me there's nothing stored there, which is good. Hit the down arrow key one more time. Now FO2 is equal to zero, no sideways triangle or equal sign. And by default, the frequency is set to one. So when I see this, it's telling me there's nothing actually stored there, which is great. It's what I'm looking for. If you hit the down arrow key one more time, it should go back to CF0 as long as there's nothing else stored in the worksheet. And it did. So I'm good. All the cash flows are in there. I want the calculator to calculate present value, which in the cash flow worksheet, the way we do that is by pressing the NPV key. NPV stands for net present value, which if we had cash outflows up front, it would account for those if we'd entered something on cash flow zero. But since we set this guy equal to zero, it's just going to give us a plain old present value. All right? When I press the NPV key, the calculator says I equals. I've asked it to give me a present value, but I have not given it a discount rate yet. So I need to put that in. Our discount rate is eight. So I can type in eight and press enter. Just like the I over Y key, it is expecting a percentage. So we want to leave it in percentage format. So type in 8 and press enter. And then I can hit either the down arrow key or the up arrow key to get back to net present value. And when I hit one of the arrow keys, it says NPV equals. It hasn't given it to me yet, but I do have the compute prompt on the top left, which means I can hit the compute key and it's got enough information to actually calculate it for me. And when I do that, it comes up with NPV equals the $25,770.97, which is exactly what we got with the previous two methods. Okay, now, we worked this problem three different ways. Of course, when you're working the problem in homework or you're working the problem for an exam, you don't have to use three different methods to solve it. This video is just walking through the available methods or the methods that are likely to be available on an exam. Pick whichever one you are most comfortable with and just practice it over and over again. There's no reason to do all three. Um, you can use either the formulas or you can use the time value money keys or you can use the cash flow worksheet. When I'm dealing with annuities, I typically reach for the time value money keys first. Um, even though my default is to go for formulas, once we have more than you know two or three cash flows, the formulas get pretty cumbersome as we're already seeing with this one. So I'm a little quicker to reach for the time value money keys because the single, you just put in the four variables and solve for the fifth. That tends to be the fastest. It's the least number of entries. Um, and so there's, the f there's fewer opportunities for mistakes using the time value of money keys.